<laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I was trying to find my computer for my Bible because uh, we're in the beach condo. Thank you, Jesus. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Art Ministry. We're bringing the morning light broadcast to you today from Seagrove Beach, Florida. We've been on a ministry jaunt uh, for about the last week. And uh, this is the highlight of our uh, uh, trip to go to the International Gathering of Apostles and Prophets that uh, we've been a part of for many years at Christian International. And it's the one time in the year Kitty and I set aside to get ministered to. And on the way down here, we, we ministered in uh, Nashville, connected with people there, Knoxville, and uh, then in Georgia we met with Priscilla Crosby, and uh, we see our friend Carla, I'm going to start naming names, now I'm in trouble if Derek. I don't name everybody, uh, we met with uh, Carla in Nashville, Lisa in Knoxville, uh, Derek and Laquanda in uh, Georgia, Priscilla, uh, and Brian. get the names. Uh, Brian and Lydia, Chloe. Lydia, and I'm trying to remember all the names of the people at the small group in okay. Georgia, Lawrenceville, and I can't do it. You're supposed to be on vacation, too. <laughs> you don't have to think that hard. But we have a just a beautiful view right out our window looking at the Gulf of Mexico. It was a lovely sunset uh, last night, and it, we just feel like this has been our first opportunity just to catch our breath Amen. Uh, on this trip uh, just doing meeting after meeting but uh, we just rejoice to connect and uh, face to face with all of our friends along the way and we're not done we'll be going to Hattiesburg we're going to try and stop in Arkansas and see a, a friend who's uh, been in with the ministry for a long time so it's a joy uh, to bring the morning light Bible study to you today uh, we're uh, dragging up mm -hmm. uh, onto the last chapter of Leviticus. And, and the thing that strikes me about the book of Leviticus is how often Jesus quotes from it. Mm -hmm. Jesus' favorite verses in Leviticus. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many places where Jesus quotes from Leviticus and he makes a statement. He says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. There are many scriptures he quotes uh, I need to do some research. I'd like to find out just how many times Jesus it can verifiably be said to be quoting from Leviticus. And it's one of those books that you have to slog through. You have to just push your way through. <laughs> and we get to go to Numbers uh, tomorrow and start reading the genealogies. I love oh, the genealogies. Oh, boy. I'm going to practice. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, can you just have to... It'd be like an athlete getting ready for it. You know, okay, I can do this. The name marathon. La, 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 la. You know, like get, her, get her jaw going real good. Like I'm going to sing an opera. In Leviticus 27, what I see that the subject here deals with vows and the tithe. And, I, and that's really interesting because in e-church, just in the last few days... Uh, there's been some really interesting uh, conversation about tithing mm -hmm. and and vows. Have you ever vowed a vow? Now, we're going to kick over a few sacred cows today, so I want you right now just hurry up and go get your snorkel gear and set it out there by your coffee because you're going to, if you feel oxygen deprived as we go <laughs> along here, you just grab that snorkel gear and take a few hits, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, we're Cute. good. Keep going. Uh, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. <laughs> uh, did you ever vow a vow to the Lord? Did you keep it? Uh, what? What then? Did you? Did you keep a vow and not receive what you asked for? Usually, a vow is connected to God. If you just do this for me, is it wrong to vow? Does God's word, when you make a vow, does God's word provide? a way out from under an ill-advised vow. And this is actually the one place under the law, remember where the scripture says God will provide a way of escape? It's really interesting because this is the only 
chapter and the only subject I've seen thus far in the Old Testament where uh, God does provide in the law a way of escape for somebody that opened their mouth and said something they couldn't back up. Thank you, God. And it's very, very interesting to find that in the Old Testament. And today, in studying Leviticus 27, we're going to consider all these questions and just what the Old Testament view is on vowing vows before the Lord. And what about tithing? Some people believe in tithing. Others think it doesn't apply today. Uh, you know, all the pastors are digging their fingernails into their armchair right about now. <laughs> you know. Relax, Take pastor. Deep, You'll be breathing at the end of it. Right. You'll be okay. <laughs> Everybody thinks I pick on pastors. If you don't know my background, you're going to think I'm down on pastors. Look. We were pastors. My grandfather was a pastor. My, my uncles were pastors. My dad was a pastor. My brother was a, a, a pastor. Several of my cousins mm -hmm. uh, are pastors. One of them is the head of uh, uh, one of the districts in the denomination that he's a part of. And, and uh, one of my cousin's husbands, and uh, I was a pastor for many years. Kitty has served as a pastor, and we are pastors, of course, on Media Church Online. And uh, so I really have, uh, about Kitty and I both have about 30 years, um, if you count it together, 60 years of pastoral experience between the two of us. So please understand, I'm not down on pastors. I grew up around pastors, surrounded by pastors. I love my pastors, and uh, but I do know some things about pastoral ministry. And as a prophet, God told Moses to speak into the people according to all that God has put in His heart. Pastors don't do that. Pastors, there. God told me when I was a pastor, He says, "You feed the people what I tell you to, and then you eat what I give you separately." In other words, He said, "Don't feed the children off of your plate." But as a prophet, I get to put it all out there, and part of that is coming out of my experience. Um, and, and to tear down this middle wall of partition between pastors and their people. Amen. To let the people get real with the pastors, and let the pastors get real with the people, because things are the way they are because of what we've been doing. And if you want something different, you have to do something different. So please understand. Uh, I, I may sound like I'm a little fast and loose with the pastors, I, but, I, but I'm not. Uh, I love pastoral ministry. I just want to see some uh, 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 revolution in those relationships so that we get everything God intended for us to have out of that ministry. Now, if you would read verses 1 through 5 of Leviticus 27, we're just going to wade into this and talk about vows and tithing and, 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 and all that fun stuff. <laughs> Walter always says, I'm glad you kids are having fun. Um, Leviticus 27 1 and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them when a man shall make a singular vow and persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation and thy estimation shall be of the male from 20 years old even unto 60 years old even the thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the of the sanctuary and if it be a female, then thy estimation shall be thirty shekels. And if it be from five years old, even unto twenty years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male twenty shekels, and for the female ten shekels. Okay, now I'm going to have her, uh, Katie, I'm going to have you read on down through verse 15, but I need to make a point. So what is he talking about? When somebody takes a little digging, the language is a little obscure here. That when a vow was made... And then somebody wanted, we're going to discuss this a little deeper here in just a minute, but a vow was made and somebody needed to get out of the vow, then the priest was required to set a, a value after the value of the shekel of the sanctuary huh. on what would be involved there. So it's this way of escape that's being provided. And, uh, and so this is why that a, a man of a certain age, he would, he would uh, buy himself out of his vow for a certain amount of money. And actually, the, the Jewish commentators, they said that not only would they, like, I they would say, I swear by myself. Well, they would they would have people come in and say, I swear by my liver. I swear by my kidney. Mm -hmm. And they would actually swear by their different organs in their body. Hmm. And then, and so then the priests, 
were required under Levitical tradition to set a monetary value on different organs of, of, of the body uh, to redeem so that the person could redeem their liver, their kidney, how they would swear. Jesus talked a lot about this. And so when we're talking about monetary values, all this has to do with a monetary value that figured in when someone vowed a vow and then either wanted to pay the vow or wanted to pay themselves out of the obligation. Maybe they vowed more than what they could handle and they needed to get out from under it. Hmm. So go ahead and read through verse 15. All right. <clears throat> verse 6. And if it be from a month old, even unto five years old... An, then, an infant. An yeah. infant. If it be from a month old, even unto five years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male five shekels of silver. And for the female, thy estimation shall be three shekels of silver. Now think about that. You vowed, I vow by my month old baby. Wow. That's what Sarah, um, Hannah did when she gave Samuel to the Lord. Right. She sure did. And if it be from 60 years old and above, if it be a male, then thy estimation shall be 15 shekels, and for the female, 10 shekels. Now, for the female, in other words, you could take a, a if you had a daughter, I swear by my daughter. There was a man who had a, in the Bible who had a daughter named Jephthah, and we'll read about that her eventually. And he was coming home, and something really good had happened to him. He says, I swear by the Almighty, that the first thing that belongs to me that I see when I return home, I will sacrifice to the Lord. Well, the first thing wasn't a bullock. The first thing was his only daughter, Jephthah. Come on. And so he opened his mouth. God had to provide a way for him to buy his way out of it. And according to this, based on her age, he had to redeem her for like, what is it, 20 shekels? A lot. Go ahead. Verse 8, But if he be poorer than thy estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall value him according to his ability that vowed shall the priest value him. And if it be a beast, whereof men bring an offering unto the Lord, all that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy. He shall not alter it, nor change it, a good, a good for a bad, or a bad for a good. And yeah, if he in other words, I vow by this... By, by a bullock, and then it's time for you to pay your bullock and say, oh, well, you know, uh, we got this real sickly one over here. Let's take it. No, he said you can't do that. We talked about that other chapters. <laughs> the other day. Go ahead. And if he shall at all change beast for beast, then it, then it and the exchange thereof shall be holy. And if it be an unclean beast, and if of which they do not offer the sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast for the before the priest. And the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad, as thou valuest it, who art the priest, so shall it be. So the priests all had to establish monetary value in order to redeem it. Got it. Go ahead. But if he will at all redeem it, then he shall add a fifth part thereof unto thy estimation. And when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord, then the priest shall estimate it, whether it be good or bad. As the priest shall estimate it, so shall it stand. And if he that sanctifieth it will redeem... So I swear by my house, the whole by house. my condo on the beach in Florida. <laughs> oh my goodness. We just borrowed it. It's not ours, guys. Um, 15. And if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be his. All right. Now many people make vows to God. Promises made in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty, hoping to break through to the Father in some area of their lives. Part of that, think about that. We're taught that Christ is our righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. God made Jesus to be our righteousness. So that means God, when he looks at you and decides whether or not to answer your prayer, he doesn't estimate you, he looks at Jesus. Amen. He's answering. Your, that's why we pray in Jesus' name. I'm not asking you to look at me to decide whether or not you're going to do this. I'm asking you to look at the, the estimation of your son. See, the estimation of who Jesus is, the estimation of his lifespan, which is eternity, the estimation of what he has done, which is gave her his life for us. And then God responds based on the estimation of Jesus, not on your estimation. See, your, your worth is eclipsed by the worthiness of Christ. And we call that the, the Christ becoming our righteousness. So to vow a vow, 
becomes a basis of of look at me. It's 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 a reflection of a deficient estimation of the basis on which God answers prayer, which is on the basis of who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us. Mm. And that's true of any area of life. We think we're going to leverage God by our tithe. We think we're going to leverage Him by... Mm -hmm. Now, we do these things because of who He is, not trying to us, not trying to get Him to be something to us. There's a 1978 comedy film starring Burt Reynolds about it, and it's called The End. And it's about a man who finds out he has a terrible disease and he's given only a few months to live. It's like pancreatic cancer, something really mm -hmm. bad. The doc is like, you're not going to make it. And, and the man, he goes through this the whole uh, film dealing with this issue and finally he decides uh, he just doesn't want to live anymore. So he goes out to the beach and he disrobes and he's swimming out into the tide. He's planning on uh, drowning himself rather than dying a painful, agonizing death uh, of this cancer that has uh, attacked his body. Finally, he, he, the, 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 the camera pans out as he's just swimming way out further and he's exhausting. He runs out of energy and uh, he's, he succumbs and slips under the waves. And he begins to, to go down, down, down. He's, he's kind of unconscious. But, as, but he's thinking as he's starting to drown, he begins to think uh, about his daughter. He begins to think and he decides that he wants to live. And now this is a comedy now. It is a comedy. And he, and he battles his way to the surface and he begins this near impossible return to the shore. I mean, it's, it's going to be a miracle if he makes it to the shore. And, and because he's exhausted. And so as he swims, he cries out to God. He promises it first as he's swimming, God, just let me make it. I'll give my life to you. I'll give my life. I'll devote myself completely to anything you want. My life will be yours. I'll go be a missionary to India. I'll go into darkest Africa. Just let me live. Let me make it to the shore. And as he gets closer to the shore, he begins to change his promise. Oh, God, if you just let me live, I'll give you all my money. Oh my I'll goodness. give all my money to you, God. And, and he gets a little bit closer and, and closer, and all of a sudden, a 90%. God, I'll give you 90%. Uh, he, he's closer and closer. And 30%, God. 30%. And he's, he's not quite there. 20%. God, I'll give you 20%. And finally, he drags himself up on the beach. And he gets up and he looks back real meaningfully at this surf and he says, I'll see you on Easter, God. Oh, and my God. Now we're back. Yay, we're back. Sorry, we dropped you. It dropped us. Well, we're going to continue. I, I don't know where we lost the broadcast. Uh, this happens when we're traveling and we're reading in Leviticus 17. And it deals with, and I just wish 27. I knew. That we're in, I'm sorry, Leviticus 27. And it, maybe somebody that was listening via chat could tell us uh, where we, we left, off. left off. I would really like to be able to give you the whole uh, broadcast. Because he was, he just finished sharing the story about that movie that talked about a vow made and changed. Talked about the man that made the vow because he was drowning and he swam in toward the shore. And the closer he got to the shore, the, the less he was willing uh, to vow. Now, see, we still have 20, 20 minutes on the clock. 
let's just see what happens. We'll stick with it. But, uh, you know, this vow was called an, uh, uh, the singular vow. And the Hebrew word is apla neder. Apla neder. The term uh, defined means an extraordinary vow or a vow beyond one's ability to keep. Hence, the mention of redemption money. Uh, it wasn't acceptable to make a vow and just walk away pretending nothing happened. Redemption money had to be paid in order not to blaspheme. Now, Jesus speaks about how this practice was profaned by the scribes and the Pharisees in his day. Matthew chapter 23 verses 16 through 21. And why don't you, why don't you type something in our chat to see if you've got... Uh, okay, I did this. Oh, good. You can hear us. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, good. They can we're sorry. We, we, had a, we had technical difficulties, but we're going to push through this time. It must uh, be important, huh? It's the word. So Jesus is now talks about these vows. And he's actually referencing this passage I'm going to read. He's referencing the, this last chapter in Leviticus. Matthew 23, 16 through 21. Listen to what he says. Woe unto you, blind guides, which say, Whoever swears by the temple is nothing, but whoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Uh, did you get that? Swear by the temple, that's okay. Swear by the gold of the temple, oh no, that you're in, in trouble. So what were the Pharisees uh, worshiping? The temple or the gold in the temple? He says, you fools and blind, whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind, whether it's greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Whoever shall swear by the altar, swears by it and all things thereon. And whoever swears by the temple, swears by it and by him that dwells therein. So in those days, and again, we're dealing with vows. Have you ever vowed a vow? Yep. Did you keep it? Did you not keep it? What do you do about that when you get in over your head because you opened your mouth and vowed something? And is your vow, what is it a reflection of? If Jesus is our righteousness and God meets our needs according to who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us, how come we have to add a vow to it in order to get God to do something? Oh, I'm not trying to get God to do something. Well, of course you are. That, that's what a vow is all about. Now, in those days, business was conducted by vow, oath, and swearing. The ancient people would vow by something, and what they vowed over determined just how reliable their word was. So if someone, for instance, vowed by the city of Jerusalem, then you would know that they would probably do what they said. But you accepted the fact that maybe they wouldn't because they're vowing by the city of Jerusalem. Okay. This is how it worked. This is what Jesus is referring to here in Matthew 16. Uh, if they vowed by the temple... That meant they had every intention. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, as we say in the Ozarks. Lord willing the Jordan don't rise, I'm going to, you know, they're going to make an effort. They're, they're going to really apply themselves because they vowed not just by Jerusalem, they vowed by the temple. Uh, but however, if they swore by the altar, then you knew every effort would be made to bring the promise about. However, if they swore by the gift or the gold on the altar, that, that meant that they had forfeit their life before breaking the vow. So in other words, it was varying wow. gradients of whether or not they could be relied upon. Mm -hmm. It was a way in their eyes of expressing intent. Jesus, go ahead. No, I was just agreeing with that. Jesus went on and talked about it this way. Matthew 5, 33 and 37. He said, again, you have heard it that it has been said of old time, you will not forswear yourself. Hello? You will not forswear yourself, but will perform to the Lord your oaths. But I say to you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, <coughs> nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Neither will you swear by your head. So again, they would swear by their head. They would swear by their liver. They would swear by their kidneys. Uh, neither can you swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white or black. Well... 
We can today, depending on the hairdresser. They didn't have Clairol in the... Uh... <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Stop preaching and went to bed on. Neither shall you swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white or black. But look at what Jesus said. Look, just let verse 37, but let your communication be yes and no, for anything else comes of evil. See, it's a sin consciousness that vows a vow. That's it. Vowing a vow is not something, and, and, and you might think I'm saying, oh, absolutely, don't make vows. You know, there may be times that you do, but I think the popular concept of a vow, we need to go back in, in, and we need to hold ourselves accountable to how, what Jesus said and think twice before we, we get involved in something like that. The exception being marriage there vows. A, yeah, those are great. perfect example. Right. Uh, vowing a vow is not something that should be encouraged. Jesus is basically saying, let every word out of your mouth be on the level of a vow. See, because the implication of a vow impugns the re reliability of what comes out of your mouth the rest of the time. In other words, if I ain't vow vowing, if I'm not, if I ain't vowing, no. yens, if I'm not vowing and my mouth is moving, then I'm lying and you can't hold me accountable. That's the, this is what Jesus is going after. Like we go, we go to court and we hold up our hand. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Well, what were you doing all the rest of the time? Mm -hmm. He isn't saying don't uh, commit yourself to the truth. He's saying let every word that comes out of your mouth be a vow. And if it's not, and if it's not at that level, keep your mouth shut. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> and now go ahead and read sixteen through. Uh, the uh, I want you to go all the way through the end of the chapter. Okay. And if a man shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of a field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at fifty shekels of silver. And if he sanctify his field from the year of Jubilee, according to thy estimation, it shall stand. But if he sanctify his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain, even unto the year of the Jubilee. And it shall be abated from thy estimation. And he that sanctified the field will in any wise redeem it, if he did. Then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be assured unto him. And he will not redeem the field. If, and if he will not redeem the field, or if he have sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. But the field, when it goeth out in the jubilee, shall be holy unto the Lord, as a field devoted, the possession thereof shall be the priest. And if a man sanctify unto the Lord a field which he hath bought, bought, which is not of the fields of his possession, then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of thy estimation, even unto the year of the jubilee. And he shall give thy estimation in that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. In the year of the jubilee, the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought, even to him who, whom the possession of the land did belong. And all thy estimations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty geras shall be the shekel. Only the firstling of the beasts, which should be the Lord's, the Lord's firstlings, um, no man shall sanctify it, whether it be an ox or a sheep, or it is the Lord's. If it be... And if it be an unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to thine estimation, and shall add a fifth part of, of it thereunto, thereto. Or if it be not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to thy estimation. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord, of all that he hath, both of man and of beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. The none devoted none devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed i see but shall surely be put to death and all the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree it is the lord's it is holy unto the lord and if a man will redeem at all aught of his tithes he shall add thereunto the fifth part the fifth part thereof and concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock even whatsoever passeth under the rod the tenth shall be holy unto the lord he shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Okay. 
Okay, so the remainder of this chapter, the first part dealing with when you vow and you vow of yourself. You're committing yourself in the vow. You vow by your life or the life of your children or the life of your daughter and how that if you vow and you get in over your head, you can redeem the person that you vowed over and they had to be estimated a certain way. Mm -hmm. Now, the remainder of the chapter deals with the dedication of resources, land, personal property, and money to the Lord. It speaks of the tithe as the devoted thing. Now notice that. You're going to see that crop up a lot in things that are dedicated to God in the Old Testament. It's the devoted thing. The Hebrew word there is kerem, and it means accursed or devoted to destruction. It is the accursed thing. Mm -hmm. For instance, when the city of Jericho was destroyed, God said, this is the first fruits of the land of Canaan. This is devoted to me. You don't take anything out of it. And what happened? Achan took something out of it, and he was called to account. He said, who is taken of the accursed thing? Mm -hmm. And they stoned him with stones, and they destroyed his whole family because he took the accursed thing. Mm -hmm. So when you took the tithe mm -hmm. that belonged to God and used it for your own purposes, it was an accursed thing. And so it's very serious. Now listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. Don't assume where I'm going, where I'm going with this. Uh, these were vol there were voluntary offerings that they were not devoted until you gave them. Like say if you're giving over and above, he describes it in this chapter, the, the part you just read. It's not devoted, but once it's given, he makes the point. He said when the giver gives it, it's devoted. He says the tithe, that's devoted already even before you give it. And, uh, and so it's the devoted thing. The voluntary offerings were given. And then some things were compulsory, like the tithe was compulsory. The voluntary offerings were, were at the disposal of the giver until they were given, and then they became holy. Now, listen, this is very important. We're going to talk more about this in a minute. So in other words, once it's given, then it's not yours. Did you ever get irritated? What are them people doing with the money I gave them? I hear this all the time. People complain. I gave that preacher a thousand dollars, and and look look what he's doing with that money. Well, hold on now. If you're talking about a holy thing that belongs to God, you better be careful how you open your mouth, because whenever you gave it, suddenly it's not yours Amen. anymore. <laughs> uh, and I just hang on with me. Don't don't don't. Don't you turn that radio off? <laughs> Don't you change that? Because I got some personal, <laughs> I got some personal testimonies to give you about that, where God corrected me on this issue. <laughs> it's like, do you know you shouldn't do that? Roman says, "Are you doing the same thing?" Let me tell you something. I know you shouldn't do that because I did the same thing. It's I'm in the confessing. Book. <laughs> Somebody forgive me. <laughs> the voluntary offerings, they were, they became holy, devoted, and again, the word is devoted to destruction. I see it's like they're radioactive. Okay. The tithe is like, it's spiritually, it's radioactive. We need to make sure it's in a lead-lined place where God wants you to give, mm -hmm. not in your wallet because it's, it's radioactive. Everything it touches is devoted to destruction. That's your money moving by the Spirit. Oh, man, if you're, if, if you're in this, this economy, if you're not given the tithe, it, then it's the accursed thing, and it puts the curse on everything around you. And so when you've got the 10% out there with the other 90%, the whole thing becomes accursed, and you're wondering why things aren't working for you. Okay, oh, you're just preaching on tithe. Actually, I'm not. And people that know me really well know, know that. Just hold on, let's keep going. <laughs> See, and then once you gave it, if it wasn't a tithe and you gave it, but once you gave it, it becomes devoted or accursed, accursed in terms of your own use. See, it becomes the devoted thing. And so you have to relinquish all control, all expectation, all demand over that which you have now committed to the Lord. Right. Now, this is an important lesson. Many people give of their substance, and then sometime later they lodge complaints that the money wasn't properly spent. Sometimes things are given, and later on the giver wants the thing returned, and bad feelings result. That's one thing that happens with, uh, I've done this my entire ministry. Uh, somebody gives something, I learned this with a guy who... Uh, gave uh, a satellite system to the church mm. so that we could watch the Norval Hayes revival with Bob Tilton back years and years ago. Mm. And then uh, later on, he decided he didn't want to do that. He got an attitude because he would, he would 
take me and he would fly me all over the country to all these revivals and all these outpourings and I would come home and implement it and he'd get mad because he didn't want me to do those things he just wanted me to hear about it don't do it we don't want to do that we don't want to we don't want to have an outpouring we just want to hear about an outpouring <laughs> And so I'd come back and I'd do this stuff. He'd get mad and he decided, oh, I want that satellite system back. Well, my policy has always been, there you go. Come on and get it, Brother Chester. It's yours. You can just come on back and get that. Okay. Same, same thing. I've had people complain. They give something into the ministry and they complain. Sometimes people will give something, particularly we've seen sizable offerings that have been given. And there are times I get a little twinge in my spirit and I send them an email. I said, now... Thank you so much, but I just want to make sure you feel real good about this. It's not that we can't receive. It just has to be given on the basis that we, we just sense that, that it's, a, it's a God transaction and maybe not something else. Uh, uh, this man, uh, he became angry because I didn't agree with him and he was criticizing other ministers. This is another experience I had. I knew a man years ago. He became angry. And when you say angry, you got to understand, he blew up in front of an entire congregation. His wife, little video wife, picked him up, put him over her shoulder, and drug him out of the church, and he was hanging on to the door jam, screaming with his veins pumping out. Because I didn't agree with his criticisms of other ministers, and he was speaking openly, so I replied to him openly. And boy, he got upset. And he complained, I gave you money, Russell. I said, hold, hold on now. I said, if you gave money to Russell, then you, you did a wrong thing. You give it to God. And if you gave it to God, then why are you bringing it up now? I said, you tell me, you just write me a receipt. You tell me how much I owe you. I'll write you a check tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> well, I never heard back from him. See, so yeah, I asked him, Larry, did you give it to God or did you give it to man? If you gave it to man with expectations and you gave for the wrong reason, my ministry is not for sale. Our ministry is not for sale. Now, myself, oh, that's just, you preachers, you're all, well, let me tell you what I did <laughs> years ago. I used to be, I didn't used to be as sweet as I am these days. Just ask Kitty. <laughs> I've heard stories, but I like the precious I have now. I've criticized what other ministries have done with the monies given to them. Years ago, I saw the extravagance of PTL under Jim Baker, the sexual scandals surrounding them, and man, I had some deep-seated and very vocal judgments against them. And then the Lord asked me one day, as I was railing against poor old Jim Baker, and the Lord asked me, he says, well, how much money have you given them? <laughs> and I proudly responded, I didn't give them a dime. And the Lord immediately replied, he said, then shut your mouth. He said, when you criticize them, you are cursing the gifts that others have given them in my name. That conversation came really young in my Christian walk. And it saved me from much bitterness and from much judgmentalism. Now, what about the tithe? T-I-T-H-E. I have a feeling you're going to tell us. <laughs> There are many questions about this today, and I'm not going to thoroughly discuss this. There's not room or time to completely deal with this. Whole teaching. There are, uh, are we required to tithe under the New Covenant? The question itself, okay, implies an attitude of bargaining with God, as the character in the film that we mentioned at the beginning of this study. Mm -hmm. Those who staunchly defend the tithe often betray these firm lines they maintain between what belongs to God and what they think belongs to them. I hear people say that. 10% belongs to God, the rest of it's mine. Hello? Excuse me? Mm. Me, my, I? Give God his 10% and the rest of it's all? You do what you want to with it? Is that right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I honestly don't think I want to have that, that, that transaction between me and God. There's your 10%, God. <laughs> Do you really want your relationship to God be defined by a 10% solution? All you tithers out there, you know, relax. I'm fixing to get the ones that don't tithe here in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But all you tithers out there, do you honestly want this important aspect of your relationship to God defined by the 10% solution? The scripture says, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. 
If you're seeking the kingdom financially according to a 10% solution, God's response to you will be exactly defined by your response to him. You give God that 10% residue, maybe he's given you out of his residue. Maybe you've only got 10% of what God has for you because you've been operating according to the 10% solution. No, he wants to have it all. How's that working for you? I hear a lot of people, oh, I tithe. Yeah, it, it, it didn't work very well, did it? Hello? Tithing? Oh, you, oh, I've been so blessed tithing. Just imagine if you gave him the whole thing. What if you gave it all to him? <laughs> I know tithing is of God. It's worked for me. Good. I'm glad. Just imagine what it would be if you gave him the rest of it. 100%. Imagine if you gave everything to him, what it would be like. Not just the 10%. Okay. What about those who relieve themselves of the tithe? Those who claim, well, I'm free and I just give as I'm led by the Holy Spirit. Here's one of the things. I, I know guys. I have friends of mine who they don't believe in the tithe and they live like it because you look at their lives and they give hardly anything. Mm. Guys I've been extremely close to, close enough to know I, knew, I could count the change in their pocket because I just knew them that well. And over this one particular fellow, over 30 years, never knew him to be a giver. And he claimed, oh, we're not under the law. And his idea of getting out from under the law is what he could get away with. Not about serving the Lord 100% giving everything to God. So those of you that do not believe in the tithe, let me, let's do a little uh, uh, check of your heart. Matthew 5.20 Jesus said, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Are you operating according to the economy of the kingdom or the economy of man? And so people who uh, see themselves as, as well, I, I, my righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, I'm not required to tithe. Okay. That means you're not limited by the economy of man. You're walking in the economy of the kingdom, aren't you? So if you are not at least giving 10%, and actually you should be giving more. If you're not, if you don't believe in the tithe, that means you're giving more to God than 10% of your income, and if you're not giving more than 10%, then your righteousness isn't measuring up to the level of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the hypocrites that Jesus said were vipers brood and the children of Satan. Sure. Do you hear me? Because there's many people that don't believe in the tithe and you check their giving and they're giving hardly anything. Barely a percentage point of that which they get. And you say, uh, well, uh, what am I supposed to do? Let me tell you something. Kitty and I, over the years, and I've been doing this for 15 years, God began to deal with me on this. He said, look, don't be concerned with 10%. Give what I tell you to give. Amen. Because I, I work, when you're in business, those of you that are in business, you know, you don't always know how much money you're making until you do reports at the end of a fiscal period. Sure. So like end of a month, end of a quarter. And so, you know, I, I'm giving what I feel like God was telling me to give. And he would say, look, just obey me. Write the check when I tell you to. And so then I would run reports. I would say, if my righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, I'm lying to myself and my unbelief is making an excuse uh, for uh, not tithing. And so I would run these reports, and let me tell you something, in 15 years of doing this, I've never given less than 30% of my income into the gospel. And there were many years I've given 60, 70, even 80% of my income into That's the awesome. gospel. Did you hear me? And guess what? I live my life. Kitty and I live our life by the economy of the kingdom. Yeah. Oh, you... <laughs> We start, like we the other day, we were talking to somebody. God's moving us in some big, big areas right now. And we were talking about uh, where God's taking us. And boy, I saw you could just, people were just sucking the paint off the wall. It's like you could sense, you know, that, that they were, their wheels were turning. And I could tell they were thinking, you know, uh, well, we're, it, they must have a lot of money. And so I said it. I said, you're thinking they must have a lot of money. No, we just have a lot of faith. Amen. Because we operate according to the economy of the kingdom, not That's the right. economy of man. Money moves by the Spirit. And money moves by the Spirit. And God's been taking very good care of us. Thanks. So, to those of you that do believe in tithing, I suggest to you that t this 10% commitment is a very anemic response to God who gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son and you're giving him 10%? Wow. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> I, I would like to have an opinion about that, but the Lord won't let me. Uh -huh. 
To those of you who don't believe in tithing, I say check up on yourself. Look at what you've given in the last year. Is it more than 10%? If your giving doesn't exceed 10%, then you've taken your liberty and allowed the scribes and Pharisees to have a better testimony than you do in this area. And you point the finger at people that tithe, you say they have a religious spirit and all of this. But, but there, if that, that be so, and you're not doing more than that, then what does that make you? Just stop and think about it. Well, why are we talking about money? Look, money answers all things. You know, I, I've seen people on food stamps and broke down car, you know, wearing, have, haven't been buying their clothes at the secondhand shop. Uh, and, oh, you're picking on poor folks. Let me tell you something. Russ Walden has spent more time in a food stamp office than you ever thought of. I know poverty. But I've come out of poverty by the principles that I'm giving you now. Yeah. If you want something different, you better learn to do something different. Things are the way they are because of what we've been doing. And don't tell me money doesn't matter because I know better. Some people are more spiritual than, than God is on these matters because he has so much to say about this very thing. Mm -hmm. See, uh, How did Jesus approach this? In Luke 18, 18 and, or we'll read verse 18 and 22. <laughs> So what am I supposed to give then, Brother Walden? You're taking my, you know, you took my tithe away from me. You took my anti-tithe away from me. Now, now look. Just tell me what leave, to give and I'll do leave it. Leave me with something uh, here. I'm drowning here. Somebody asked me one time, well, is Russell Walden God? I said, no, sir, but he works for God. <laughs> so Jesus is talking to the rich young ruler. You know, they're... they're there's only one group of people that think about money more than the rich, and that are the poor. In fact, the poor, they can hardly think of anything else. <laughs> he said, a certain ruler came to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And that word eternal life was not eternity in heaven. It means irreducible life. How would you like to have a fixed income? How would you like to ha live your life according to an irreducible, unlimited supply to do everything that God has put in front of you? Amen. An irreducible, a checkbook that you write on that, that can never be drawn down, that, it's, that, the, ca that the check always clears. Yes. How would you like to have? What must I do to inherit an irreducible supply? That's what the, the guy was asking. And here's what Jesus said. Are you ready? Verse 22. When Jesus heard these things, he said, you lack one thing. You're doing good. You go to church. You're doing all this stuff. That's great, wonderful. He said you lack one thing. Sell all that you have. Mm -hmm. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. Quit thinking of yourself as a repository. Become a distribution point. Now say that with me. I'm a distribution point. I'm a distribution point. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sell all that you have. Distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. In other words, that you're going to start drawing your checks then, not upon a fixed income, not upon a limited earthly supply. The checks of life that you write now in terms of time, money, energy, health, you will draw them on a ba the bank account of heaven that can cannot be drawn down, that cannot be reduced, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Let's have that. Amen. Oh, but not everybody's called to do that. Yes, they are. <laughs> well, that's not even possible. That's not true. Russ and Kitty Walden are an example of what uh, Luke 18.22 is talking about. You just come on down and have a mentoring day with us someday. Come, come travel with us for a couple of weeks, and you'll see what it looks like. It's just, it's, oh, it doesn't make sense. That's right. It's not in the mental realm. That's right. It's in the realm of the spirit. You can live your life according to unlimited supply, but you've got to be willing to give it all. You've got to be willing to become a distribution point. You've got to be willing to render up. And as you render up by the leading of the Lord and do what you see the Father do, you will enter into this level of supply because everything you have belongs to God. You're only a steward. Now ask yourself, are you like the, the fat steward of the white city in J.R. Tolkien's hmm. novel, Return of the King? You know, the character, he ruled the city in the king's absence, but he resisted the demands of the rightful heir to the throne. Your life is not your own. You are bought with a price, and that includes everything that belongs to you. Your earning power, your finances, your bank accounts, your personal property, your time, every decision you make. If your life doesn't radically reflect this, 
Then, as Jesus told the rich young ruler, you will not inherit God's irreducible resources. This means that you will suffer lack unnecessarily. And it's true, Jesus said, you're just picking on the poor. It's true, some people just aren't going to get this. Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. And it's a fact. Some, and, and let me tell you something, I've seen people with lots of resources. But they have a poverty mentality. It's heartbreaking. And they don't see themselves as a distribution point. Mm -hmm. They think everybody's out to get something from them. Are you listening to me? God wants you to be a distribution point. God wants you to live your life according to his irreducible supply. God has given, uh, made supply available to you to have enough to do the will of God and to help somebody else do the will of God when he direct, so directs you to do so. We're not interested in some legalistic aspect of giving God our little paltry sums and then he lets us alone where the other 90% is. No, We're obvious. going a lot further than that. We can't even breathe on our own. If you think <laughs> about it, we got a, the breath in our nostrils are from God. <laughs> so make it your determination to lose the religious attitude about giving and vowing and swearing oaths and quit pointing the finger at the tithers of their religious spirit and and quit championing your liberty that I don't have to tithe when you don't give anything when you you look and you're not your righteousness isn't measuring up to what the scribes and Pharisees that crucified Jesus did and let's get back let's just come fall at the feet of Jesus let's kiss his feet let's break open our alabaster box and anoint his feet and kiss his feet and wrap our arms around him and say everything I have is yours Thank Jesus you. and all of a sudden you're writing that your checks of life and health and finances on the uh, bank account of heaven that cannot be drawn down folks it's possible to live this way today our whole society uh, denies this because we live in a, in a, in a credit-based debt debtor society. And Pharaoh says make payments without jobs. And Pharaoh wants to get after you in the tax base and on, through, through credit and, and hold you bound. But God wants you to live in liberty. And, and Kitty and I have experienced by the sovereign grace and mercy of God. We've blindly stumbled into some things that it took him years to teach us after we got blessed. Now let me show you why you're blessed and how that's working. And our job is to show it to others. You can live your life according to an unlimited supply, but you got to start thinking just a little bit differently than you do. Amen. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that it's not, um, you're not a hard taskmaster. You just want us to give back to you what you gave to us. And then there's a wonderful cooperation of fellowship in the earth. And it opens the windows of heaven and pours out the blessings that cannot be contained. That you're the more than we could ever ask or think, God. But we got to stop and ask. And we've got to stop and think. As Russ has said, if Jesus, uh, if i got to pray, you got to pray, Russ. So we want to just give ourselves back to you. And today, this Monday, we give ourselves to you once again in this morning light. And we bless you and honor you with our lives and our very breath, Father God, that we received of you. And we bless our listeners in Jesus' name. Amen.